My name is Taylor Ellis. I'm here to tell my story. I want other people to know about recovery, um, to know a little bit about what I've been through, um, you know, how there was a time when I felt that I had no hope. Um, my life was completely unmanageable, um, and I was able to to turn that around, you know, with the help of others and become the person who I feel that I was really born to be. So I was born into a pretty troubled family. Um, both of my parents um, su struggled with substance use, as their parents did. Um, my mom alcohol and um, a lot of mental health issues as well, untreated, and my dad um, throughout his life, multiple different things, but um, crack cocaine was the, the main thing that caused the most issues. Um, my mom was really young whenever they got together and, um, and had me, and um, you know, they got married and they, they tried to make it work and try the best that they could. Um, but that fell apart quickly. Um, whenever I was about 18 months old, um, they split up and um, my mom, uh, you know, she left. Um, and it was just me and my dad. And my dad's addiction actually got worse. And that was, you know, the crack cocaine that he was on at that time. I remember like waking up in the middle of the night. Um, I actually remember this at that young of an age, waking up in the middle of the of the night and being home alone in the house, or being left in the the car outside, um, you know, for maybe hours at a time while he was inside a house, you know, doing drugs. Um, although I didn't know what he was doing at the time, and it's crazy because I was in like really bad neighborhoods, you know, um, neighborhoods that like I would kind of prefer not to even like drive down the road with my kid in the car. And um, he would just leave me in the car. And um, I remember like all I was scared of at that time was like that like a little arm was gonna reach out from under the seat and grab my leg, um, you know, cause I was just a kid, you know, I didn't really understand like real dangers. I would go to my mom's every other weekend uh, whenever I was, and I really enjoyed that time with her. Whenever I was in elementary school, my mom, um, began opening up to me and telling me stories about her life um, and some, like, really traumatic things that happened to her. And um, I've actually, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I have done some, in my treatment, I did some work through ACA um, and the Adult Children of Alcoholics, and it talked about how they, uh, how parents can share, overshare with their children. And my mom did overshare with me. She, um, she told me some really traumatic things that happened to her in her childhood. And, um, and it kind of affected me. I, you know, like she shared her whole life story with me. I was the first person she ever shared it with. And she was always like, you're my angel, you're my hero. You know, I kind of became her counselor in a sense. And, um, and that's, that ended up being how I connected with people is I wanted to lose myself in their experiences. Um, so I became a very codependent adolescent, um, and when those relationships that I was that I was building with people failed me, um, you know, failed to, you know, give me the escape that I was looking for, um, I ended up turning to drugs. Also, my whole childhood and up until the last semester or so of high school, I was like a straight A student. That was another escape. I could escape into my schoolwork. The only thing that was holding me back from accomplishing anything that I wanted to accomplish was the fact that I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and I didn't know myself at all. All that I knew how to do was to do what other people told me I should do. I was completely out of touch with myself. I didn't know how I was feeling. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know where I wanted to go or why I was here. Um, and so I got into the drugs and 
I had an escape from that. You know, I felt like for the first time I could feel something. You know, that was my feeling in a way. So I graduated high school with a really high GPA. I graduated with honors. And um, I decided I was going to take a semester off. And um, about 10 years later, <laughs> I, um, I realized that, you know, my life had fallen apart, really. Um, I didn't just take a semester off. I put everything behind me that, you know, I had worked for up until that point. This is how I started using drugs. Um, before I started using drugs, I, um, okay, I became friends with somebody in high school. They smoked a lot of weed, one of my best friends, and my dad was just smoking weed at this time. He had gotten a little sober. Now he's just smoking weed. And he had like a huge bag of like some homegrown weed under his bed. And I knew about it. And one of my friends was smoking weed. And so I remember going under his bed, getting that big bag of weed out, and I would just like pinch some out of it, like grab a handful, put it in a bag, and then I would get like $10 for giving it to my friends. And so I was like this high GPA, high school student, never got in trouble, really quiet. Um, just so happened to also be like selling weed um, to her friends. And I remember one day, um, they, he really wanted some weed, or his brother did, my friend's brother, really wanted some weed, and he didn't have any money, so he was like, hey, I have these pills, and they're really worth like $5, but I'll give you five of them, and you know, and if you just give me $10 worth of weed, I'll give you five of these, and, and you could sell them and make more money. Well, like, I didn't know anybody to sell these pills to, and, like, I wasn't looking for them, so I just put them in a bag in my room, um, in a purse, you know, and hid them. And then, you know, and I didn't even really smoke weed yet. I just sometimes with my friends. Um, and uh, one day, it was a really bad day. Um, it was a really bad day, and my stepmom had, had wrecked her car, um, there was, she had just like recently, you know, like attempted suicide and there was just like a lot of stress going on in my life at that, at that time. I, um, I took one of the pills out and I broke it in half because I was like, I don't want to take this whole thing, you know? And, and uh, I broke it in half. I took the pill. I forgot that I took it after that. I didn't really know what to expect or what I was doing. Um, and, um, I think I maybe took a nap or something. I woke up and um, and I remember talking to my stepmom on the phone, and we we didn't really connect well. Um, but in that in that phone call, we connected so much and like we talked and we cried. And after the phone call, I realized, oh my god, I took that pill. That's why I was able to, we just had that heart to heart talk is because I took that pill and, you know, now I can feel my feelings and now I can, I can, I can communicate so much better. And I was convinced that it made me better. Yeah. So I, um, I, that was the beginning, you know, I would take a half of a pill, maybe every couple of days or whatever, but eventually I ran out. Um, eventually I started trying other pills too. Some that I liked, some that I felt made me better, and some that freaked me out and that I didn't take. Um, and um, so it was like that for a while. I, um, but I ended up, um, I ended up going to harder drugs after about five years of functional drug use, um, I went to harder drugs. There is a drastic change in, um, in, in what happened after I, it's like before hard drugs and then after hard drugs. Mm -hmm. 
You know, I could, I could believe the lie, you know, that I didn't have a problem during my functional drug use time. After that, after I went to hard drugs, the, there was no lying. There was no lying to anybody, no lying to myself. You know, with the other stuff, I could put it down for a few days at a time. Um, with the meth from the first time that I did it, um, the withdrawals, the, like, the coming down was so horrible, um, I, didn't, I couldn't handle that. Um, so I would just do more because it was like the only way to feel okay. I was already addicted to other things, you know? And so I already have these addictive, like, this addictive brain, this, these addictive tendencies. Um, and um, that was kind of game over for me with the meth. Um, I lost my job. I actually had my own house. Um, and I, everything I lost. Um, and, you know, I, I was able to, until that time, I was able, able to maintain a decent reputation in the community. You know, I had good images on Facebook and, you know, nobody knew the things that I was struggling with. But within a few months of me doing the meth, I uh, had a mugshot out on, and I'd never, I, but prior to this, I had never been I had maybe gotten like one speeding ticket, you know, um, and I had a mugshot out and it was, you know, it said meth on there, like methamphetamines, my picture. And it was on Facebook and it was going around. And that was horrible. Um, I remember I found out I, I was asleep and I woke up to my phone buzzing, 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 buzzing. And I had like a hundred friend requests. Um, I had messages from like everybody I knew and I clicked on the photo and it had just, had just basically just gone up. And I, I clicked on like what they were talking about and it had tens of thousands of views. I was just like, oh my God, you know, it was a whole article um, because I'd gotten pulled over in a vehicle with, with, um, with somebody and there, um, you know, and, and there was meth. The, the driver threw meth out the window. Um, and I mean, you know, I was using and stuff, I, um, but we all got charged with that. And then I had like an Adderall pill in my purse. Um, so anyways, I went from, you know, I could just stop, you know, and everything would be okay, you know, to, okay, so now I'm looking at felony charges and you know, and everybody knows that, you know, I'm just this person on meth with felony charges and, you know, so that was a, uh, that was a big deal to me. Um, I began to lose hope. You know, I remember in high school, like I wanted, I didn't know what I wanted to be, but I wanted to be something along the lines of like a doctor, lawyer, you know, um, and it's funny because I took a career test in high school that said I should be a counselor or a social worker. And I was like, nah, they don't make enough money. Um, it's funny because now I'm going to school to be an LCDC. I have a 4.0 GPA again. Um, I work um, for a nonprofit in recovery support services as a program coordinator at Avenue 360. And I love my job. I love the people who I work with. I actually read my textbooks and I enjoy reading them. Um, you know, and so it's funny. I, during my treatment, or no, after my treatment, I took another career test and it told me that, it told me the same thing again. And it just like, it flashed back to in high school reading, reading those same words. And I was like, oh my God, like it's still 10 years after everything I've been through, it's telling me the same thing. And I was like, okay, God, okay. I didn't say yes then, but I'll say yes now. Like, I don't want to find out like what my life's got in front of me if I say no again. <laughs> um, and I love it. Um, you know, I feel like that's, this is where I'm supposed to be. Okay, so let me tell you about how I came to find sobriety. Okay, so I, um, 
I'll disclose I'm a lesbian, but during my drug addiction, I was on meth, you know, and other drugs, and I uh, was sleeping with men for money or pleasure, whatever. I was on drugs. It didn't really need a reason to do anything. But um, during that time, I ended up getting pregnant. Um, And I knew that, and I kind of wanted to because of the fact that I saw no reason to live. And as irresponsible and ridiculous as I know that that is now, um, and like a self-perpetuating cycle because that's why my mom got pregnant with me. And I remember thinking in my life, I know how selfish, like that's so selfish. Um, But you know, that's what happened. I was a total wreck. I was very suicidal. I, my life was, was a mess. I was, you know, waking up in a hotel room, um, trying to figure, you know, it's about to be checkout time. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to come up with some money, you know, to pay for a room for another night, or am I going to be, you know, throwing all my stuff in a backpack and, you know, walking down the street looking for somewhere to charge my phone so I can figure out how to come up with some money so I have somewhere to be inside, um, you know, and there was a lot of other bad things too around that time. But I, so I was, you know, I was suicidal. I there, I felt like there was no hope for me. Um, and so, and I would just kind of like find people that I could like cling to. And I felt like if I could, you know, if I could save them or if I could help them, then it would give me a reason to keep going. But I couldn't help any of these people. Like I couldn't even help myself, you know? And so it was just like, bad, bad, bad. Um, like one thing after another kept going wrong. And, um, I got taken advantage of a lot because I mean, I was asking to be taken advantage of basically. And so I, I thought, you know, if I get pregnant, um, I can just, you know, give my life to this person and they'll be like worthy of it. And, um, that's the most crazy and irresponsible thing again. I was high and um that's kind of how that how that went down I um I was I would take a pregnancy test and I took about three um the first one and this is like within the course of several months um the first one was negative the second one was negative and I remember feeling kind of disappointed whenever I saw that and then this the one pregnancy test I took uh, it, I actually bought, I went to Walmart, bought a pregnancy test and went to the restroom and took the pregnancy test in the Walmart restroom. And I saw the second line come up and, um, I, my entire body like turned red and flushed. And I was like, what the hell have I done? Um, I was like, what am I doing? You know, like what, what is wrong with me? Like, why did I do this? Um, why would I bring somebody into this world? Why would I bring somebody into my life even? Um, because I don't, I don't have control. Um, but I thought, okay, well, I'll try now. I'm going to try. I'm going to stop using. I'm going to try. I'm going to, I'm going to figure something out. Um, and so, you know, I told everybody, you know, look, I'm pregnant. Um, and throughout my entire pregnancy, I actively tried to stop using uh, meth. I tried. Um, I wanted to. I cried after I'd use. I'd cry and be basically, if not literally, pulling my hair out before I used. And I couldn't stop. I. But there was multiple times where I was able to stop for maybe up to a week max. Um, then, I don't know, I would end up using again, uh, and I hated myself every day. So, yeah, I was in a hotel room in Webster whenever... Um, 
whenever the contractions got so bad that I had to go to the hospital. Um, I had minimal prenatal care. Um, I was taking the vitamins um, and, you know, but I had very minimal prenatal care. Um, I, uh, I remember one of my friends got a, um, got a rolling chair because we didn't have a wheelchair. I sat in a rolling chair. They rolled it to the elevator and then rolled me to the car. I said, take me to Clear Lake Regional Hospital because I know it's a good hospital and this baby needs something good. Um, and so I went there um, and I just told them the truth because I was like, whatever happens to me is whatever, you know? Um, I told them, you know, I've been using, this is what's going on. Um, they checked me, I was nine centimeters dilated. Um, I had actually been in labor for probably days. It's crazy. I just thought if I just put my feet up, if I just keep my feet up and I stay sober, you know, maybe, and I couldn't even get sober, but I don't know. I, I was crazy. Um, so, so I'm nine centimeters dilated. The girl who I think that I love is there with me. Um, and at still at nine centimeters dilated, she says that she needs to go out to the, she needs to go meet somebody in the parking lot, um, and that she'll be right back. Um, I'm like, well, just wait, you know, just wait. And uh, she was like, I'll be right back, I promise. And she left, and she actually took the, my keys with her and left in the car for like several days, um, which I didn't know at the time that she had the car, but whatever. Um, and so I was there alone whenever I had my baby and, um, I was really fortunate for that because at that time I got to really bond and connect with him. I remember looking at his eye, looking in his eyes and, um, and seeing, it was, it was, a spiritual experience. I saw, I looked at him and I thought, you know, how, I thought about how my mom, I thought about my mom at some point in time, looking at me in the hospital, just like I was looking at him. And I remember thinking that he's perfect and he's innocent and he's doomed, you know, to, to be just like me just like I was doomed to be just like my mom in ways. Um, and I wanted to protect him. And I didn't really know how, um, but, you know, in that moment, I decided that I was going to try and I was going to try my hardest. Um, uh, Shortly after this, you know, about two and a half days later, a social worker came into the room of the hospital um, and I was given discharge papers and told that it was time for me to go and that I was not taking him with me. Um, rightfully so. Um, that was the, the pain that I felt that day and that experience was also pivotal in my life because I needed that. I, I cried like I've never cried in my life. I've never felt that pain um, before, and I felt a lot of pain. Um, but that was, um, that was like the only pain that I knew that drugs wouldn't take away. I knew that using drugs was going to prolong that pain. And, um, uh, you know, I was really able to, to make a decision, um, and so even though before I knew, like, that I wanted to stop using, and I wasn't able to, that time I was able to, um, and I think I was really fortunate that I went to Clear Lake Regional Hospital and that, um, I guess the, we, I ended up giving them my, my dad and my grandma's address, which was in Fort Bend County. And so I got a 
CPS case in Fort Bend County. And Fort Bend County, although it's a very strict um, CPS program for for the young um, children, um, it was exactly what I needed. They offered, they offered, they mandated a lot. And um, at first I looked at the list of things that I was gonna have to do. And I was like, I mean, I'm probably not gonna be able to show up on time successfully to a Zoom meeting once a month, honestly. Like that's where I was at at that time. Um, but really there was so many different obligations and responsibilities on that list that I had to do or else I would be in violation with the court because I automatically was in court. Um, for They were suing me for custody of my son. And um, so anyways, I had, to, um, I had to get an assessment for drug and alcohol use. I had to, um, I had to go to treatment as a result of the assessment that determined that I needed inpatient therapy, which I was convinced that I didn't because I had now been sober for over a week, you know? So obviously in my mind, you know, I've been sober for over a week now. I made up my mind for real this time. Um, no, I went to inpatient and that was exactly what I needed. Um, and they also had me engage with the behavioral health services at um, in Fort Bend County. And we met once a week for about an hour um, for over a year um, on Zoom or in person. And they taught me parenting skills in a way that was very trauma informed and um, that I was able to relate to. Um, I, again, it, it played, like what I learned with them, it played into my understanding of how my life got out of hand and my understanding of how it would be easy for me without healing to allow my son's life to get equally out of hand. Um, I was really blessed that I, that I had a CPS case there. I had to go to court every month for over a year before, and I stayed sober this whole time. I passed every UA, I did all the things, but still, they wanted an entire year before they considered, you know, letting me have my rights. And, um, you know, I did that, and throughout the whole thing, the judge was really nice. Um, and at the end, he was like, you, he was like, you're like the poster child for CPS. Um, I mean, I've never been a poster child before, but I'll take what I can get. Um, so it it went well. Um, I learned things that I never would have learned outside of that. And while I, I went to treatment at Santa Maria, at first I went by myself. They said that I couldn't bring, you know, I, that I wasn't going to be able to reunite with him in treatment, um, that I... Um, I needed to go by myself that, and that, you know, I needed to work on myself. And so I did. I went to Jacqueline House, Santa Maria. I, um, and I gave myself to the program. Um, I surrendered. You know, at first I was, didn't really trust them. I was like, they're going to go report back to CPS. CPS is going to find out about, about my life and how messed up it really is. And they're going to be like, no, you cannot have a baby. Like, I don't care how long you stay sober. You're, you're a mess. Um, and I'd been on meth. So I was paranoid, you know, uh, my brain was all whacked out, but I surrendered. I was like, okay, it hit me. If I go in here and I lie my way through treatment, I'm not going to heal. And I really wanted to heal. You know, I really wanted to heal. Um, and so I, I told the truth, and it was hard. And, um, and I basically uncovered everything about myself um, and the treatment. My counselor and my recovery coach advocated for me in court, and I was able to, in time, get my son back with me. I was allowed to be his guardian um, while... Basically, they placed him with me, but he was still in their custody. Um, while I was in treatment, 
at Santa Maria. So they basically they transferred me to the treatment program for women with children. They allowed me to have my son there and I could leave at any time, but I couldn't take him with me. So um, I didn't leave, obviously. Um, and so I, whenever my son was three months old, I was able to be reunited with him. I found out that I was going to get him back on my birthday on October 8th, and he was brought and met me at Santa Maria um, Benita House on October 9th. And, um, you know, we've been together every day since then. And uh, I'm so in love with him, and he is beautiful and amazing and perfect. It's crazy because I know that my place as a parent is to teach him how to live and teach him how to love. I mean, he's taught me those things, you know. Um, so it's just been a really beautiful experience. I'm doing great in school. I love my job. Um, you know, yeah, life is good. He's my why. And it's crazy because, you know, I hated myself and stuff too, but mm -hmm. having him, it's now... God forbid I ever lost my son. Don't God forbid that. But I've actually learned to love myself. Mm -hmm. I've learned to love myself. I know myself and I love myself. And even before my drug addiction, that's not something I've ever been able to say. Mm -hmm. um, and I can say that with such honesty now. You have to want it and you have to let somebody know that you want it. And if that person doesn't help you, let somebody else know and keep letting people know until you find somebody that helps you because, because it's out there, because you can't do it yourself. You can't get sober on your own and you definitely cannot stay sober on your own. You need support. That is the most important thing. Yeah. So in my second week of treatment, I wrote this and I didn't even know how true that it was. It's like, it's amazing. But I said, um, today I woke up feeling grateful and lucky. I feel excited and capable. I'm so fortunate to have gotten this opportunity to come into recovery. At first, it's kind of hard to take recovery seriously. There have been times in my life when I resented recovery programs and people who acted all excited about recovery just kind of got me annoyed. Before I actually started wanting to get better for me, it all just sounded like a bunch of blah, blah bullshit. But now I see it differently. We're in such a good, we are in such a good place. We can go anywhere from here. There's a whole staff of people here to help us with anything, any problem we may have. Uh, we, can get, we can get solved or at least begin to get it resolved here. No matter where you are, you can take what you get here and end up somewhere better. For me personally, this is a relatively new realization. I'm in the beginning phases of recovery, so I'm like scraping the bottom of the recovery barrel, just trying to get all of the toxicity, the poison, out. This is the part where I have to force myself to process the uncomfortable feelings I like to pretend don't exist. Because the more I ignore my feelings, the more they directly affect my negative behaviors, thus enabling me to continue screwing up my life. I have to dissect my shame and find the underlying guilt and recognize that I am not the messed up person or the messed up things that I've done or the messed up things that have been done to me. And my guilt is what tells me so. It says, Taylor, this feels bad because this does not resonate with you. You're acting out of your own character. So that says I have good character, right? Um, I have to deal with CPS. I have to get my ID. I have to get my birth certificate, my social security card. I have to remove people from my life, probably forever, who I truly felt I couldn't live without. I have to figure out where the hell I am going to live. I have to figure out how the hell I'm going to pay for it. And these are just, and these are the things that overwhelm us. This is what feels bad. But this is the bottom of the barrel of recovery, where we start over. We get a vacation and we get to start over the clean slate. Some people, in fact, a lot of people in active recovery have already overcome the, base, the basic bottom of the barrel things. 
Once we clean the toxins out of the barrel, only then can we begin to fill it with safe, non-toxic water. And that's when it gets exciting. That's when we can start having something. And when we start having something, that's when we can start giving something to others that's actually healthy and not toxic. And you stay connected with other people who achieve, who started at the bottom of a barrel like yours. And together, you can keep going, redefine redefine your boundaries, redefine your limits, redefine your goals, redefine yourself with the same people or the same type of people who are encouraging you now. And eventually, the barrel is going to runneth over if you keep at it. Stay in recovery. Just continue to work up after all your current goals are completed. I think I was I was quarantined at the beginning of my treatment. Um, and, yeah, so we were in quarantine, and so it was, like, a lot of time just, like, alone with my thoughts and feelings. Um, not alone. It was with also with some a few other strangers who were going through similar things. Um, we were all a mess, and we were locked in a, um, an apartment together. Um, and I had my assignments. I had been given multiple assignments, and I was just in, in the room. I couldn't leave with a bunch of assignments that asked me to look at look at yourself, you know. Um, and so I could either look and look at myself or look at the walls. And so I was kind of going crazy. Um, but on the other hand, I there was like a light shining in the room. And it was like, but there's hope, you know, for the first time, there's hope. And so that's kind of why it starts out saying, you know, this is the shitty part because that this is the bad part. Um, and so I was, I wrote it and it was like, you know, like my connection with God or my higher self. And it was, that's, you know, like what was taking the pen I was saying, it's going to be okay. You know, like this is the beginning. This is the, this is the bad part. You know, but there, there's hope. You're just scraping the bottom of the barrel right now. And one day you're going to have something in that barrel that's not toxic anymore. You know, and you're, it's gonna, your barrel is going to runneth over and you're going to be able to pour into other people's. And so that was, um, that's what I, what I got from that. And I wrote it down because it was just so brilliant. It was just coming to me. And then I read it to, you know, the other people in the room. And, you know, we all got excited together. Yeah. And... I carried that with me. I carried that feeling, um, that hope for recovery and what it could be. Um, and I still have that today. And my barrel runneth over, you know? Um, it does. I'm so happy. Uh, my life is really good. I have great people in my life today. Um, yeah. Yeah.